this lecture, we will learn the following things. We will learn how to define kinetic energy and momentum while incorporating special relativity. We will learn about the nature of mass and the concept of intrinsic mass. And we will learn about the relationship between energy, momentum, and mass. Now, let's take a look back at Newton's second law from the perspective of classical physics, and in particular have a look at momentum or classical momentum in the context of this discussion. So in introductory physics, you are introduced to the concept of momentum roughly as follows. Historically, it was observed that there appeared to be a conserved directional quantity associated with motion. This quantity, which we call momentum, is well defined in the classical domain of physics, that is, low velocities or large scales, by the product of the mass of an object, m, and the velocity of the object, u vector. So we arrive at the definition, the so-called classical definition of momentum, by taking the product of these two things, m times u, and that gives us p, the momentum or linear momentum of that object. Now in a closed and isolated system, perhaps with a whole bunch of different objects, i equals 1 to n, it is observed that this quantity overall is conserved. That is, the sum of all momenta of all objects in a closed and isolated system can be written as a singular number, the total momentum, and that total momentum remains constant no matter what happens inside that closed and isolated system. Now, when a system is not closed and isolated, for instance, subject to some net external force F, then the full beauty of Newton's second law is observed to be obeyed by the system. That is that the net force acting on the constituents of the system is just given by the change in momentum of that system divided by the change in time, or dp dt. So Newton's second law, F equals ma, can actually be rewritten in terms of momentum concepts as just F equals dp dt. Now, of course, we need to bridge from classical physics to modern physics. And to do that, I want you to start thinking a little bit about the laws of physics and their invariance under transformations from one inertial frame of reference to another. Recall that one of the postulates of special relativity is that the laws of physics should not depend on what frame of reference you are measuring them in. They should be the same for all frames of reference. And the consequence of that, of course, is that you can't tell if you're in an absolute state of motion. But the benefit of that is that it preserves the forms of the laws of physics for all observers, regardless of whether or not they're moving. So if one subjects the classical momentum concept to consideration moving from one frame of reference to another, imagine a second frame of reference observing an object moving at speed u prime, and that second frame of reference, s prime, is moving at relative velocity v to the original frame s. Now, imagine that this is all closed and isolated, and in the rest frame, the velocity of the object is u, and in the moving frame, it's u prime, and, and the conservation of momentum will hold. And so, for instance, if we take the momentum observed in the rest frame for this object, so p equals m times u, and we use the Galilean transformation from classical physics to move to what we observe in the moving frame, we find that, of course, the moving frame will observe p prime equals m times u prime. And we can relate the momentum in the moving frame and the momentum in the rest frame using a Galilean velocity transformation, changing u prime to u minus v, and then distributing that inside the definition here. So when we do that, we find out that the momentum observed in the moving frame is related to the difference between the momentum observed in the rest frame and sort of the frame momentum itself, m times the velocity of the moving frame. Now, if we then consider changes in momentum in the moving frame with respect to universal and absolute time, so dt prime or dt, it doesn't matter which in the classical view of physics, we just wind up taking the time derivative of momentum in the moving frame. And if we distribute that time derivative to the two terms on the right-hand side above, we find that we have du dt and dv dt. 
Now since the moving frame is moving at a constant velocity relative to the rest frame, dv dt is zero. That is, the moving frame is not accelerating with respect to the rest frame. It's moving at a constant velocity with respect to the rest frame. So this second term is zero. And we see that we recover exactly dp dt in the rest frame. In other words, dp dt in the moving frame is the same as dp dt in the rest frame. This is Newton's second law. And so we find that this transformation in classical physics leaves the form of Newton's second law invariant, at least under Galilean transformations, assuming that's the correct terms for transformation of space and time and velocity. Now, this should all work in domains where the speeds are low compared to that of light. But we know that the original definition of momentum was predicated on experiments and observations that were all done in that low velocity, large scale regime of investigation. That is sort of the human scale of speeds and sizes. And we also know that that wasn't quite correct. The Lorenz transformation, not the Galilean transformation, gives the correct way to define relationships between frames. Great, well, let's just take the classical definition of momentum and apply the Lorenz transformation, the correct transformation between frames. So when we do this, of course, we find that the momentum is equal to mass times velocity. And we want to view this in the moving frame, where the momentum in the moving frame should be mass times the velocity in the moving frame. Well, if we insert into this the relativistic transformation of velocities in special relativity, we wind up with this nasty thing over here, the mass times u minus v over the quantity 1 minus uv over c squared. That's the thing we have to insert that contains the velocity of the object as observed in the rest frame, and of course the relative velocity of the two frames. All right, well, fine. So let's then transform this into a statement about differentials. So if I try to write the differential of, of p prime uh, in terms of the differential of p, the momentum in the rest frame, if I do the calculus on this, I wind up with this horrible looking thing here. And then, of course, if I do dp prime dt prime, which would be the change in momentum with respect to time in the moving frame, that's related to the change in momentum with respect to time in the rest frame by this horribly velocity dependent thing here. This is bad. Why is this bad? It's bad because it totally violates the first postulate of special relativity. The forms of the laws of physics must be invariant across all inertial reference frames. But here we see that one frame has that force is just equal to dp dt. But in the other frame, that very same law is horribly velocity dependent. This is not good. And rather than throwing the whole concept of momentum out the window, what we should do is stop and ask ourselves, did we really define momentum, the conserved quantity associated with degree of motion? Did we do that assignment correctly in the classical regime of physics? Did we just get the wrong definition? Is m times u too naive a definition of momentum, given now what we know about space and time and invariance in special relativity. Now, in order to come up with a more appropriate and physically correct definition of momentum, that is relativistic momentum, there are many, many alternative approaches to finding the correct definition of momentum. Textbooks gloss over this because in many cases, the framework for coming up with the exact form of this is not really approachable to students at the level uh, of a student taking this course. So I had to cherry pick a methodology to motivate where the definition of relativistic momentum might come from. And I prefer the method that comes from my colleague, Darren Acosta. So let's assume that the problem in the original definition of momentum was that of the definition of time used in the time derivative of space. Momentum was defined as mass, times velocity of an object u. Velocity is the derivative of space with respect to time. So perhaps it's that time definition that's the flaw in the original definition of momentum. After all, that definition of time did not regard changes from frame to frame as having any appreciable effect on time. dt 
was not necessarily invariant from frame to frame, and in fact could have been the root cause of the problem we saw on the previous slide. However, there is in fact a time unit that all observers, regardless of their states of relative motion, can agree on. They can agree it exists and it can be measured the same way in a specific frame every time. And that is proper time, denoted with the letter tau. So if two events occur, and those events are observed by all observers and all frames of reference, all observers agree that proper time will be observed in a frame where the two events happen at the same spatial location. That is the definition of the proper time. It is the shortest time duration measured in any frame by any method of measuring time durations using two events. Now, it's always possible to find such a frame. If you're not in the frame where proper time is defined, you could always accelerate yourself in such a way until you enter the frame where the regularly occurring events that will be used to define passage of time occur at the same place. The time in any other frame is going to be given by the relationship between time in that frame and the proper time. So in any other frame, the time t for a frame moving at velocity v with respect to the proper time frame is simply given by gamma, the gamma factor associated with the motion of that frame relative to the proper time frame, times the proper time duration tau. Now we're talking about inertial frames of reference moving in relative constant velocities with respect to one another. And so as a result of that, the gamma factors involved here will not be time dependent. They are defined using constant velocities of objects or constant velocities of frames relative to one another, or both. So consider an object moving at velocity u with respect to the proper time frame. That in and of itself, that object would be a frame of reference that's in relative motion to the frame in which proper time can be observed. So let's trade the old time derivative in the definition of momentum. That is, momentum equals mass times the first derivative of space with respect to time for the derivative with respect to proper time. That is, momentum will now be defined as mass times the first derivative of space with respect to proper time. Now we want to convert that into any other frame specifically into the frame where the momentum is being measured, which may not be the proper time frame. And to do that, we just substitute for d tau with the relationship between it and dt. And if you do that, you'll find that you now have mass times the first derivative of space with respect to time times a factor of gamma. So if this is a better definition of momentum, one that preserves the second law from Isaac Newton under transformations from frame to frame, then we should be able to show that. And the definition that we get from this exercise using proper time derivative instead of just the plain old time derivative is that the momentum of an object viewed from a reference frame is given by the gamma factor of that object relative to that frame times its mass times its velocity as observed in that frame. Now again, I want to be careful here because the gamma factor that appears here is very specific. It has to do with the gamma factor associated with the velocity of that object viewed in the frame of reference. The object itself could be viewed as a reference frame, of course, but because we're going to start talking about transforming object velocities into other frames moving at speed v relative to the one where we measured it, it's extremely important to realize that there are suddenly going to become multiple gamma factors in your equations. Some of those gamma factors will relate to the observation of the object and the passage of time relative to its frame of reference. And some of the gamma factors will be related to the relative motion of other frames of reference relative to the one in which you're defining momentum. And if that all seems confusing, it is. And the only way to get better at this is to practice, practice, practice. So the gamma factor here I've denoted especially with a subscript u to indicate that it is not 
the velocity of another reference frame, v, that appears in here, but rather the velocity of the object itself, u. And so this gamma factor is defined as 1 over the square root of 1 minus u squared over c squared. That's what gamma with a subscript u is going to refer to. Now, this redefinition of momentum can be demonstrated with a lot of algebraic pain to leave Newton's second law invariant. And in fact, this is accepted to be now the correct definition of momentum. I leave it to the viewer to go through the exercise sketched out on a previous slide to transform the momentum of an object observed in one frame into another frame moving at velocity v with respect to that first observing frame and show that the form of Newton's second law, dp dt, remains invariant from frame to frame. Now, any good definition of momentum will hopefully respect the observations of the past that at low velocities, the classical definition of momentum seemed to be good enough. If special relativity is the more correct general framework for describing space and time, then in some appropriate limit, in this case, low velocity of the object, we should be able to recover the classical definition of momentum. So let's give this a try. And I'm going to begin by writing the gamma factor for the moving object, gamma with a subscript u, as a binomial expansion. And I've used this before in an earlier lecture. So hopefully the rhythm of this will begin to look familiar. The binomial expansion is very useful for carefully step-by-step -step exploring what happens when you send a parameter of the theory, in this case the velocity of an object relative to that of light, closer and closer to one of its limits. So we'll start by writing down gamma subscript u with its traditional definition of 1 over the square root of 1 minus u squared over c squared. And then we can use the binomial expansion approach to write it instead as a series of terms of increasing powers of the velocity over c. So the first term is just 1. The second term is 1 half u squared over c squared, etc. After that, you have terms of order u to the fourth over c to the fourth, u to the sixth over c to the sixth, and so forth. Those terms matter when u over c is very close to 1. But when u over c is very close to 0, those higher order terms really don't matter so much compared to the lower order or leading terms in the expansion. So now, let's write relativistic momentum using this series expansion of the gamma factor. So I have momentum is equal to gamma subscript u times mu, which is now this series expansion times m times u. And you'll notice now that I have an extra u to multiply into the series expansion. If I take m times u and distribute it to every term in the series expansion, I wind up with something that looks like this. The leading order term now has a dependence on velocity, but the subleading term has a dependence on velocity cubed over c squared. And then the terms after that are velocity to the fifth over c to the fourth, or velocity to the seventh over c to the sixth, etc. And as u approaches zero, that is, as the velocity of the object gets much, 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 much lower than the speed of light, essentially as its velocity is sent towards zero, any terms that depend on u cubed over c squared or higher in this expansion are going to vanish. They're going to approach zero much faster than that leading term of mu. The leading term will dominate the series expansion as u over c gets very small. So I can start from this expanded version of momentum using the binomial expansion and in the limit that the velocity is much much less than the speed of light only the first term in the series will survive the one that's largest compared to the others as u over c goes to zero and that's just m times u. We have recovered the classical definition of momentum in the limit of velocities that are small compared to the velocity of light. So we can proceed similarly now, having had some measure of success with looking at momentum as the quantity, the directional quantity of motion, thinking about kinetic energy, which is the scalar or directionless quantity associated with motion that can also be conserved. So let's begin to think about kinetic energy in special relativity. Did we really have the right definition in the old days? One half mv squared, is that the relativistically correct definition of kinetic energy? 
Well, we can start by looking at the relationship between external forces, changes in states of motion, work, and kinetic energy. When an external force acts on an object and displaces it over some, for instance, straight line distance s vector, the action of accelerating this object under the influence of an external force represents itself a unit of energy being imparted to the object, and that energy is known as work. Work done by an external force changes the kinetic energy of the object. It was in a state of some kinetic energy, maybe zero, and then a force acted on it and accelerated it, and now it's in a different state of kinetic energy because its velocity has changed. That means that the work done by the force has had some action in changing the kinetic energy of the object, and according to the work kinetic energy theorem, the change in the kinetic energy of an object is directly proportional to the work done by the external force. Now the work done by the force on the object displacing it over, for instance, a linear distance s vector, can be written as the dot product of that external force and that displacement. Now I'm taking some shortcuts here with the form of the work equation. This is for a constant magnitude force displacing an object over a straight line distance. That's not the general form of the work equation, and I will use the general form of the work equation in a moment. So let's assume a constant force acts on an object from the perspective of an observer in frame S. And the, of course, the, the form of that force and its relationship to the momentum of that object and the changes in momentum of that object will be given by Newton's second law. The force is equal to the change in relativistic momentum with respect to time. This is now the correct definition of momentum in that frame. And used in any other frame preserves the form of Newton's second law, which is F equals MA or F equals DP DT. Now, let's say the force acts over a small displacement, a differential of a path, DS vector. And at any moment, it's related to the velocity of the object and the time over which the displacement occurs via the fact that the object velocity is the change in the path position divided by the change in time in that frame. In other words, u vector is ds vector dt. We can write the differential of work, the little bit of work done by that constant force over that little bit of displacement by thinking about the definition of work itself in a more general form. That is, the little bit of work done in displacing the particle over a little bit of path, ds vector, by a constant force f is given by the dot product of f and ds vector. Now, by Newton's second law, this has to be equal to the first derivative of the relativistic momentum with respect to time. That is what the force should be equal to. And again, that thing is dotted into ds vector, the little bit of displacement. But we can replace ds vector with its relationship to the instantaneous velocity of a particle under the action of this external force. ds is just going to be equal to u dt. Now to simplify this dot product, I'd like to assume that the change in momentum is in the same direction as the force that's applied on the object. So the force is entirely directed in the direction of the displacement or the change in momentum or the change in velocity. And as a result of that, the dot product trivially becomes the product of the magnitudes of the two vectors. To find the total work done by the force, which is to be related to the total change in kinetic energy, if I can find the total work being done by this force, I can absolutely relate that to delta k, the change in kinetic energy, and perhaps arrive at the form for the kinetic energy. What we're going to do is we're going to integrate both sides. So by the work kinetic energy theorem, the change in the kinetic energy of the object, whatever equation that is, is given by the work done by the force on the object. And that is going to be the integral of this equation here, the sum of all the little bits of work should add up to the total work. And so that equates to taking the sum of all these little bits here. And if I pull out all the constants in all of this, I'm going to wind up with the mass times the integral of u times the quantity uh, d gamma u u. The dt's have canceled out here in this dot product, leaving us with just a differential of the gamma u times u. 
Well, that doesn't look like a very pleasant integral, but there is a way that we can get this into a more pleasing form, one that's more easily solved. I'm going to start by rewriting this relationship, delta k equals w equals m times the integral of the speed times the differential of gamma u times speed. To get this into an easier to solve form, we're going to integrate by parts to get a final form for the integral. This is using the trick that the, for instance, integral of u dv is equal to uv minus the integral of v du. So let's make some identities between this more general form of the equation and the specific stuff that appears in the integral up here. I'm going to identify u as being equal to u. That's straightforward. I'm going to identify v as being equal to gamma times u. When I do that, I can then write u times v, which I need here, as gamma u times u squared. And then I need v times du. Well, v times du is just going to be equal to gamma sub u times u times du. That's pretty straightforward. Try this on your own. This will help you dust off your integration by parts. But you'll find that the integral becomes the following. The change in kinetic energy is given now by substituting in using the integration by parts trick as m times gamma u times u squared, evaluated at the endpoints of velocity, the initial velocity ui and the final velocity uf, minus the mass times the integral of gamma u du, again evaluated between the initial and final velocities. And if you work through all this, you'll get an equation that looks something like this. You have this first term, m gamma u times u squared, plus the second term, which looks a bit nastier, mc squared times the square root of 1 minus u squared over c squared. And we are to evaluate this at the endpoints of the motion. So let's do ourselves some favors here and assume that the initial speed of the object is zero. That means that the initial kinetic energy must also be zero. Whatever the equation for kinetic energy is, that's got to be true. The final speed will just set to be u, some final speed u that we achieve. And at that point, the kinetic energy is k. So substituting all this in, we find out that the kinetic energy is equal to m times gamma u times u squared plus mc squared times the inverse of gamma u minus mc squared. And rewriting this, doing some algebraic gymnastics with the gamma factors and mc squared, you'll find that this can be simplified to this lovely little equation here. The kinetic energy of a particle is simply given by the quantity of its gamma factor minus 1 times mc squared. Now, I'm going to let you show that last step on your own. It's good practice for the gamma factor gymnastics that you'll often have to do in these problems. We find that the relativistic kinetic energy is just gamma u minus 1 all times mc squared. m is just the mass of the object, c is just the speed of light, and gamma u is its gamma factor relative to the frame in which the object is being observed. You can use the binomial expansion trick once again, and I encourage you to try this on your own in the limit that the velocity is much, much less than the speed of light, and you'll find that the expression reduces to one-half mu squared, the classical definition of kinetic energy. These quantities for momentum and kinetic energy have all the right behaviors. They don't look like what they looked like in their assumed classical forms, they reduce to their classical forms in the appropriate limit, and they leave laws of physics invariant where they can be applied. Now, we've looked at momentum, and we've looked at kinetic energy, but what about the total energy of an object in special relativity? In classical physics, the total energy of an object was just its kinetic energy, and if it wasn't moving, it was said to have no energy. Now, that's not entirely true. If that object was being acted on by an external conservative force, it's possible that that object could have some potential energy associated with it. For instance, if you raise a ball up in a gravitational field, it has some now stored potential energy. If you let the ball go, it will be released and turned into kinetic energy. But for a force-free situation, an object at rest really had no defined energy in classical physics. Is that still true? Well, we can start by just simply noting that, as before, the total energy of a body in any system is composed of at least two parts, a kinetic part describing the energy associated with its motion, and a potential part 
describing any energy that is stored internally in the system, and that could be released by some means. Now, the total energy, then, is the sum of these two pieces. So I will use capital E to denote total energy, K to denote kinetic energy, and U to denote potential energy, or stored energy. And we see that kinetic energy in special relativity is the difference of two pieces. K is equal to gamma mc squared minus mc squared. So if we rearrange the above total energy equation and then plug in this expression for kinetic energy, we arrive at an interesting preliminary conclusion. So if I take k and solve for that using the above equation, I find that k is equal to the total energy minus the stored energy. And if I substitute in with this equation, I find that k is also equal to gamma u m c squared minus m c squared. And by identifying and relating terms in these two equations for k, I can draw the conclusion that the total energy of a object is given by gamma u m c squared. And the stored energy of an object, even one that's at rest, is m c squared, its mass times the speed of light squared. So by this identity, the total energy of an object in special relativity is given by gamma u m c squared. And in the limit that the object is at rest, we see that the total energy becomes not zero, but m c squared mass times the speed of light squared. And we note that the same quantity mc squared has been identified in the above exercise as a kind of energy stored somewhere in the object. What's particularly remarkable about this exercise is that by our own means we arrive at a conclusion that Albert Einstein too arrived at in his miracle year in 1905. It's one of the most profound conclusions drawn from special relativity, that mass is itself a form of stored energy. And even when a body is not moving, its total energy is not zero, but rather decreases to a minimum given by E equals mc squared. And this latter equation is one of the most famous in the history of science. It is an equation that would lead to the development of nuclear weapons, nuclear power plants, the PET scan, a non-invasive medical invention, the particle collider, and many other technologies taken for granted, feared or loved in the modern world. For an indivisible, fundamental particle, for instance, the electron is a pretty good example of this. We've never seen that the electron is made of anything else. One has to conclude then when, when it's at rest, its energy is the result of some kind of intrinsic mass, a fundamental property of matter, just like electric charge appears to be a fundamental property associated with matter. Now, it's, inter it's interesting to ask yourself, well, how much energy, if I could find a way to convert it into some other form, is contained in the mass of an object? Well, consider the fact that a typical-ish human being has a mass somewhere in the realm of 60 kilograms. And if by some means all of that could be converted to another form of energy like kinetic energy or chemical energy or radiation, then the above equation tells us the energy in joules that this represents. E equals m times c squared, which is 60 kilograms times something that's about nine times 10 to the 16 meters squared per second squared. This yields a total energy in joules stored in your body in the form of mass energy is 5.4 times 10 to the 18 joules. Now, for comparison, the energy, the little sliver of energy that reaches the Earth from the sun every second, a tiny bit of the total energy that the sun can emit, and yet the same energy that keeps our planet warm and hospitable to life as we know it, that energy is 10 to the 17 joules. The stored energy in the form of mass energy in your body is a factor of 10 more than that. And if it, even a fraction of it could be converted into some other form of energy, it represents a terrifying amount of potential. So let's do an example of this sort of hidden energy of matter by considering the mass that's lost by a uranium nucleus 
during fission, the process of breaking that nucleus into pieces. Nuclear fission was itself first discovered by physicists and chemists Otto Hahn and Fritz Strassmann, and this was done in Germany in December 1938. If you know anything about your history, this was the period of Nazi rule of Germany. Now, the observation of nuclear fission, especially the fact that the uranium nucleus was observed to split into nearly two equally massed parts, was a bit of a mystery. And it was explained very quickly thereafter by physicist Lisa Meitner and her nephew, Otto Frisch. The physics community came to understand that what was going on here just in breaking up the nucleus of a uranium atom was the potential of a vast power that lays in the hearts of all unstable atoms to be unleashed on humankind. So consider the process shown at the left. This little blue ball is supposed to represent a neutron, one of the components of a nucleus. They can be freed from the nucleus and fired at other nuclei. A neutron striking a U-235 nucleus will set off a chain of events that results sometimes in it breaking up into roughly equal mass pieces. A nucleus of the element krypton, krypton-92, and a nucleus of the element barium, barium-141. Now, the mass of the unsplit U-235 nucleus is given in atomic mass units using this number. And I'm keeping the precision on purpose because small differences when it comes to mass energy matter a lot. Now, the masses of the daughter nuclei, Krypton-92 and Barium-141, are 83.798 atomic units and 137.327 atomic units, respectively. Now, I should note that for purposes of conversion, one atomic mass unit is given roughly as the mass of a proton, 1.6605402 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms. Now, if you check, the daughter masses do not add up to the parent mass. Mass is not conserved in this process. It's lost in the fission process. And the amount of mass that is lost is roughly 14 atomic units. Even accounting for the fact that three neutrons get produced in the fission process, that only adds up to roughly three atomic mass units. That's still 10 atomic mass units or so of energy left over that could be converted into forms like kinetic energy or heat. Now, since we've checked that the daughter masses don't add up to the parent mass, we recognize that there's missing mass energy here. And that mass energy that's missing is about 2.1 times 10 to the minus 9 joules, about a billionth of a joule. Now that doesn't sound like much, but consider what's going on in this cartoon at the left. Three neutrons have also been produced in this process. Three neutrons that are bullets that can be fired at other U-235 nuclei that might be lingering nearby. For instance, if you highly enrich uranium to greater than 90% pure U-235, it's possible to set off a reaction of events that cannot be stopped and has catastrophic consequences. This process can initiate what is known as a chain reaction, as you multiply the fission process over and over and over again using these neutron bullets that get produced from the first fission process. So for instance, the first split makes 3 to the 1 neutrons. The second generation of splits makes three to the two neutrons, because each of these neutrons goes on to split a uranium nucleus that produces three neutrons. So that gives you nine. The third generation gives you three to the three, or 27. A typical chain reaction in purified U-235 can go something like at least 40 to 50 generations before this device will blow itself to pieces. That's a multiplicative factor of about three to the 45, or 3 times 10 to the 21. So you're taking the energy left over from one split and you're multiplying it by about 10 to the 21. Now those neutrons won't all go on to split uranium nuclei. Some of them will be thermalized and will result in dumping thermal energy into the body of the material or into the surrounding air around it. If the energy of those neutrons is converted to heat from collisions, you'll find that this level of multiplication is sufficient to explain the explosive yield of the very first uranium atomic weapon, codenamed Little Boy, 
which was equivalent to about 13 to 18,000 tons of trinitrotoluene, or TNT, being dropped on a single city. That's 54 to 75 trillion joules of energy. That weapon devastated the Japanese city of Hiroshima at the end of World War II. So we can see that a little bit of mass energy goes a long way, and it can have positive applications in society, it can have negative applications in society. But all of this stems from the revelation that energy and mass are not distinct from each other. Now, in classical or Newtonian Galilean physics, there is a relationship between momentum and kinetic energy. We know that. It's K equals P squared over 2M. Go ahead and try it yourself if you've never seen this before. Convince yourself that this is true in classical physics. P equals MV, K equals 1 half MV squared. Do the substitution. There's a relationship between kinetic energy and momentum. Now, in the more correct description of space and time given by the special theory of relativity, we have kinetic energy, mass energy, and momentum. What is the correct relationship between these things? Let's begin with the momentum equation. That is, momentum is equal to gamma u times m times u. Let's then insert a sort of clever multiplicative one. Multiply this equation by c over c, which has the effect of just multiplying the equation by one, but allows us to distribute the c in a useful way. We can take the denominator, one over c, and move it to the left and associate it with the velocity of the object u. So we wind up with a term of u over c in this equation. Now, we know that the equation for total energy has c squared and gamma u in it. And gamma u depends on u squared over c squared. They're related to each other. So I recommend you, you try squaring this above equation. Square p, which then squares this thing on the right-hand side, gamma u times m times u over c times c. And when you do that, you get this equation here. Now, if you then use the fact that u squared over c squared can be related to gamma by 1 minus 1 over gamma squared, you can then insert that and you find that p squared is equal to m squared c squared times the quantity gamma u squared minus 1. Now, if you stare at this for a moment, you'll notice that this equation has a piece in it that's awkwardly close to e squared. e squared, the total energy, would be given by gamma squared, m squared, c to the fourth. So multiply both sides of this equation by c squared. We wind up with p squared, c squared on the left. This is going to be equal to m squared, c to the fourth, times the quantity gamma squared minus one. If we then distribute the m squared c to the fourth into the parentheses, we wind up with this equation. And we can identify the first piece here as e squared, and the second piece here as m squared c to the fourth, or the square of mass energy. So putting it all together, we find that energy and mass and momentum have a relationship to each other. And it's an elegant relationship between an object's total energy, its momentum, and its mass energy in special relativity. And that relationship is given by this quadratic equation. E squared equals P squared C squared plus M squared C to the fourth. Now, this equation allows us to think about some cases of certain kinds of particles. And one very interesting special case is to look at particles that have no intrinsic mass. Now, the electron is a particle with intrinsic mass. The muon is another example of a particle with intrinsic mass, albeit 207 times that of the mass of the electron. But we can ask ourselves, what if there is a particle out there in nature that has no intrinsic mass? Can it exist? And if it did exist, what would its properties be? Well, let's take a look at that. We can use these relationships to study this very special case. Now, it will turn out that photons, which are the particles involved in light, have never been observed to have an intrinsic mass. They behave as if they have no mass at all. So let's go ahead and take that exact limiting case of m equals zero. And if we plug that into the energy, momentum, and mass energy relationship, we find that we're left with e squared equals p squared c squared. That is, 
we can take the square root of this and say that the total energy of a massless particle is given by its momentum times the speed of light. The total energy of a massless particle is entirely energy of motion. In other words, if such a particle could be stopped from moving, you would have to interpret it as them ceasing to exist. Their total energy would suddenly become zero. But of course that violates the conservation of energy. You can't just make energy go away without consequence. So this implies that such particles can actually only be stopped when they're removed from the natural world by being absorbed into another process. Now, you might then feel emboldened by this and say, aha, well, this is great. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and figure out what E and P are for massless particles, but then you very quickly run into a problem, and that is that E depends directly on M, and P de depends directly on M, as defined in special relativity. And so you get no useful information from these equations from special relativity. Special relativity can't give you otherwise useful information about what the total energy actually comes from and what the momentum actually comes from for such particles. So what is it that defines energy and momentum of a common particle like a photon, which so far as we know has no intrinsic mass, no mass energy? Well, to answer that question, we're going to have to wait a little bit longer and see as we enter the next phase of this course. So to conclude this lecture, let's look at what we have learned. We have learned how to define kinetic energy and momentum while incorporating the principles of special relativity. And in doing so, we've learned something deep about the nature of mass. And we've learned to appreciate that there is intrinsic mass in nature and that mass in general is associated with a kind of internal energy of all objects. An object at rest does not have zero energy. It has internal energy given by mc squared. We've also learned about the relationship between energy, momentum, and mass. We've looked at some applications of the relativistic concept of energy, momentum, and mass. And we've left ourselves with some questions that we can hopefully resolve by delving deeper into nature in the next phase of the course.